ago. Did his he, death he count? He died a long time before the yeah, play started. Okay. <clears throat> so, you read Hamlet. How about some thoughts? The last scene was so bad. Bad? What do you mean bad? Bad, bad. like Michael Jackson bad? Bad good? Bad? Like, Ooh. I just, when I was reading it, I kind of just sat there laughing. You laughed in the final scene of Hamlet. Yes. <laughs> So that would be the opposite reaction that I think our author was going for. It's, uh, I've always found it difficult. I just, I hate reading in the old, like, speech. And I, I can, like, a lot of people will, they'll say, uh, once you read it for a while, you get into it, and you kind of get into a rhythm. And I never, ever get into a rhythm with Shakespeare's stuff. And I hate it. I hate, but like the story, if I, if I went and saw it on a stage, I think I would really like it. Mm -hmm. I just, I can't read it. And that's been the biggest issue with Shakespeare, is the fact that, you know, in today's society, it's highly unreadable. But yet, when acted out and performed, it's quite good. Did any of you see Macbeth or even play a part of Macbeth? Like the one here, see a song Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was really good. You know, and it was all the Shakespearean language and Shakespearean speech and everything, but it was very entertaining and interesting. Well, with inflection, it's so much easier, but there's, I mean, you can't really inflect. Anything. Well, it almost seems that with inflection, even if you don't know what the person is saying, you get the meaning yeah. based on the interaction between the characters. Reading a Shakespeare play is atrocious. That's why I had to do it. Um, I will say the nice thing about the summer class is you only read one Shakespeare play. In the actual 12BT class, there are two Shakespeare plays that you read and you sort of write a comparison paper between the two. Hamlet is considered to be probably the greatest of all of Shakespeare's plays. It's also one of the lengthiest, so that's a bit of an issue too. But it falls into a category that is very famous for Shakespeare plays. So first of all, you have your comedies, which the comedy of Shakespeare is not comedy that you would expect from the Farley Brothers or any sort of Seth Rogen movie based society. Comedy for Shakespeare meant what? A happy ending. A happy ending, but usually that ending was what? Tragic. Comedies end in marriage. Yes, they always end in marriage. So the final scene in the comedy is always a wedding scene. Which is why some critics have suggested that if Shakespearean comedies were one act longer, they would actually be tragedies. But nonetheless, they end in an actual marriage uh -huh. ceremony, and all nice. Shakespeare plays are how many acts in length? Five. All of them. Five acts. That's your typical format for a play. So basically, you plug it in. Act one, something happens that sets in motion the rest of the play. Act two, you get to know the characters, plot develops. Act three, in a tragedy, someone significant always dies in act three. Act four, things rush to a conclusion. Act five, everybody dies. That's your format for a Shakespearean tragedy. So you have comedy, you have tragedy. There are two other categories. Sometimes they don't always get separated. So the first one is going to be our history. The second one is going to be what's called romance. Sometimes people will consider comedy and romance the same. A romance play is not a romantic Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks sort of thing. Uchi, uchi, uchi. Romance here means the intrusion of the fantasy elements. So if you have a play that has magic or fantasy or suspension of belief or something like that, these are the four primary categories. You have read at least one play in at least three of these categories. So think about the Shakespeare plays that you've either read or encountered. Go back to 8th grade with many of you. Julius what did you Caesar. read in 8th grade? Is Julius Caesar a tragedy or a history? A both. It's, it goes right here. The play Julius Caesar is actually called The Tragedy of Julius Caesar. So it's usually placed here. A Midsummer Night's Dream. A Midsummer Night's Dream. Did you read Romeo and Juliet? Yeah, Romeo and Julius, Tragedy or Hamlet. I nailed it. And some of you have seen Macbeth, mm -hmm. which goes over here as well. You don't spend a lot of time in history plays in school. Honestly, the history plays are a little dry, although when you get into them, some of the characters are, are fantastic. One of Shakespeare's most enduring characters comes from, uh, comes from his history plays. There are a lot of history plays. They usually follow the kings, 
and they usually follow um, the um, the lives of very significant people. Um, was what was the one the Shakespeare Company just brought? Was it Richard the probably the third? third? Um, Richard the third. Um, there's a great line that begins Richard the third. It um, he he's just an evil evil character, the King Richard the third, and the play starts with Now is the winter of my discontent. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was kind of so. Yeah. Who, wait, who were you referring to when you said one of the most uh, enduring characters? Um, <clears throat> his name his name starts with an F. You say he's not the most enduring. Oh, he no, he's Francis. No, we'll we'll look him up here in just a second. He, Francis. Um, you may not have heard of him, but he's considered to be one of the funniest characters that Shakespeare's ever made. Um, and um, I can't believe it. What is he in? Um, yeah, look up, look up Shakespeare characters starting with that. What's um, he in? What's it from? You don't even know that. Come on. I just can't remember. <laughs> I haven't read these since grad school. Um, his tragedies are the most famous, and that's usually for a very particular reason. Everybody reads Romeo and Juliet, and usually they read it in ninth grade. Everybody reads Julius Caesar, usually in tenth grade. And everybody reads either Hamlet or King Lear. Yeah. The other big one is called Othello. We got, we got a lot of M <clears throat> characters for Shakespeare. We go Fabian, uh, Sir Falstaff. Fay. That's it, Falstaff. Falstaff. Yeah, Falstaff. Um, He's just a very, very funny character. Very body, very big, large guy. Your tragedy plays, wait, let's put Julius Caesar up here. Your tragedy plays, as I said, all follow this particular set formula. And the formula is, act one, something significant happens that sets in motion the tragedy of the play. So, think about this from the perspective of Romeo and Juliet. What happens in act one that's going to ultimately bring about some of the major issues in the play? They meet. Before they meet, Romeo is actually in love with another girl. Anyone remember her name by any chance? Rosaline. Okay. The beginning of the play, he's in love with Rosaline. He sees Juliet and says, whoa. Then discovers, yikes, she's a Capulet. She's I'm a Montague. She's a 12 year old. How old is she? <laughs> she was like isn't 14. She, isn't she, aren't they like 12? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. It's okay. It's all good. So, that sets in, in motion the tragedy. Act two, things begin to build. Act three, two significant characters die. Oh, uh, Mercutio. Mercutio yeah, dies because Tybalt kills him. Romeo kills Tybalt. Romeo's banished. In act five, Banish Romeo him. returns, thinks Juliet's dead, kills the prince, kills, uh, or not prince, Paris, kills Paris, kills himself. Juliet kills herself, and then it says Lady Montague, Romeo's mother, dies from heartbreak. Everybody dies. Yeah, no Shakespeare tragedy. <coughs> Think about Julius Caesar. Wait, so what's Act Four? The building to the conclusion. The rise, rising it's action. Boring. It's not boring. Things are falling into place like on a chessboard. Think about Julius Caesar. Act One. What happens in Act One that sets in motion the tragedy of what's about to come? JC gets elected. Not elected, but he gets offered the crown. Who offers him the crown? Probably the most significant character in the play. Uh, the B. Mark Antony offers to Julius Caesar the crown. Brutus and Cassius see this, and they say Caesar is too ambitious. Act two, they come up with a plan. Act three, they kill Caesar. Funeral speeches. Act four, Chaos erupts. Act five, everybody dies. Because that's what happens in these tragedies. And it's all about bringing this together to that moment. A modern day example of this would be the movie The Departed by Martin Scorsese. Right? I, I just want to say that again. You've got everything <laughs> building. At the very beginning, something happens, which is Matt Damon is recruited by the Jack Nicholson character, the gangster character, to be kind of a bad cop. At the same time, Leonardo DiCaprio is recruited to be an undercover cop. Things begin to build in Act 2. Couple significant characters die in Act 3. Act 4, things build. Act 5, everybody dies. But you see it happen, and the way it unfolds, you think, oh my gosh. It's almost beautifully tragic. It's just, it's just so well orchestrated and organized. And at the same time, frustratingly sad. When I saw The Departed the first time in the theater, I thought Leonardo DiCaprio was going to, you know, take care of the situation and win. And be the good guy. 
You then, then you watch it and you're like, what? No, no. There's so many, so many aspects. No, Just watch it. The, the funky these the <laughs> these modern tragedies are really kind of a remake of these Shakespearean tragedies. And the Shakespearean tragedies go back to some of the Latin roots. Now, number our timeline. Your Old English time period. 500. To, to what event? Uh, the, the guy comes in. Yep, what guy? William. William. The, 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 the Conqueror. The 1066. Uh, Roughly 1500, the Renaissance starts. Shakespeare is our Renaissance man. Shakespeare is writing 1564 to 1616. He's actually not writing in 1564, but he's born. He is our you know, pivotal Renaissance character. He brings these plays quite literally to the stage, and then therefore the world to the stage. So he is in this time period writing these plays. <clears throat> they're being performed, and they're being loved by both the people, the groundlings standing in the front of the theater, and the very upper class citizens sitting in the back in the nice seats. These are our significant tragedy plays. You read Hamlet, and Hamlet follows the same mold. And as we said before, it's kind of hard to read Hamlet. Usually what I do in 12BT is I have the students watch an entire movie version of Hamlet, which is about three and a half, four hours long. It takes about a week and a half to watch the whole thing with commentary. We could have done it in a day. We yeah. could have done it. We are instead only going to watch selected scenes from it. Because the thing I want to stress from Shakespeare is even if you don't necessarily love the play, love the plot, love the characters, one thing you have to walk away with from Hamlet is at least an appreciation for his language. When we looked at the first 26 lines of Paradise Lost last week, we looked at the way that the writer used language to bring about a central purpose. The thing that Shakespeare is probably most famous for are his soliloquies. Now remind me, what's the difference between a monologue and a soliloquy? A soliloquy is delivered to nobody. Yes. A monologue is delivered to people. Yes, usually there are other people on the stage for a monologue. Soliloquy, the character is all by him or herself. And therefore, everything that's said is meant to be the honest truth of what's on the character's mind. In Hamlet, our massive brainiac of a character in this, in this play has so many soliloquies, and so many of them considered to be absolutely famous. The most famous of all Shakespearean soliloquies comes from this play. It's called Hamlet's Immortal Soliloquy, and of course it begins with the immortal words, to be or not to be. To be, not to be. So what we're going to do today is continue our close reading as kind of a segue into poetry for Thursday. And in doing this, we're going to look at a couple of the soliloquies and analyze them. Lots of fun. We're going to do this as a practice round for the first two or three. Then you're going to do one all on your own to see how you do. Then we're going to watch some clips from this play, Hamlet. So let me start with this. The first soliloquy in the play, Hamlet. It's a lengthy one. And I want to see if any of you can provide the context for this soliloquy for me. This is at the very beginning. Hamlet has just seen the ghost of his father, and what information has the ghost given him? Told him that his uncle, who was the king, killed his father. This is pretty significant information. First of all, he just talked to a ghost, so that's cool. Second of all, the ghost is the ghost of his father. Then the ghost shows up and says, hey, my brother, your uncle, killed me. Now remind me, what's the what, what's the scenario here? How did the um, how did the uncle, how did the brother kill the king? Ola, do you remember? Oh, um, he poisoned him through his ear. When the king was what? Drunk. He was asleep. He was asleep in the garden. And poured it into the ear, poison, horrible, horrible poison. The king dies. Then the brother takes the crown and what else? Right. And the wife. Hamlet now has a problem. The ghost of his father has just informed him that he was wrongfully killed. Therefore, Hamlet's job as a son is to do what? Avenge, Avenge the father's death. Avenge. What's the problem? He doesn't. Well, the initial problem is that who is the person who killed the father? The king. The king. That's a problem. Who is he to Hamlet? His uncle, and now his stepdad. 
So there's this weird moment where Hamlet's father wants Hamlet to avenge him, but the person he has to avenge is also his father in some ways. And so there's this moment where Hamlet just isn't quite sure what to do. But at the very beginning of the play, he is mad and sad and upset, even before all this ghost stuff. Why? You think about the most obvious reason. His dad is dead. Nobody seems to care. No one seems to care. His mom immediately married him. Yes, brother. Yes. He's ticked. Here's my mom. Runs off and marries the brother. My dad just died. I'm the only one who seems to care. This is a horrible scenario. He's mad. He's upset. And at this point, he's thinking, what is the point of all this? Why should I even bother to go on living? And then he utters this soliloquy. So, we're going to try something here, just trying to get our minds going this morning. Noah will especially appreciate this, having been in the speech class. We're going to read portions of this out loud as if we are Hamlet. So, mindset is this <clears throat> we have to imagine a very depressed state and a very frustrated state, wherein you feel powerless, but also as if you want to express emotions. And when you read, you have to read with expression. I'm going to have you read in your seats, unless I feel that you're not fully getting to that inner expression, in which case I'll have you come up here to the podium. So we're going to start with Noah, since he has all this speech training what? that he went through. Noah, I just want you to read the first four lines, and I want you to read them as if you are Hamlet. Is that a typo in the first one? No. Okay. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God. No, no. I'm, I know. I'm... You know what? <clears throat> we'll return to Noah in just a moment. But before we do, let's look at these first four lines. Let me grab my pen. Because without it, you are powerless. Powerless. Oh, that this too, too solid, and actually in your text, it probably said sullied. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a do. What is Hamlet wishing for in these first two lines? Death. Death. And not just death, but that what? Just like ceases to. His body just disappears. I just want to melt away. I'm sick of this. I just wish this flesh, this solid flesh, would just melt. I just, I know no more. No more. Just, just cease to exist. Then he says, or, if I can't do that, I wish that the everlasting, who's that? God. How do we know it's God? Yeah, well, <laughs> capital E, and the meaning of everlasting. That the everlasting had not fixed his canon. Biblical. One N. What's a canon? Biblical. Biblical text, his law, his canonical law, against self-slaughter. What's self-slaughter? Suicide. What's he saying here? Why can't he kill himself? It's a sin. Man, I wish I wish I could just melt away to nothing. Or I wish you know God had made it a sin to kill oneself for crying out loud. Oh, he's so frustrated. There's the repetition of God. Oh God, God. Oh just wants to die. He's sick of this. You ready, Noah? No. I... You, mm. We'll try someone else first. Yes. Let's try Sam first. Okay. Capture it, Sam. Capture it. First four lines. The first four lines? <laughs> yeah. One well, okay. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, fall, and resolve itself into a do. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh God, oh God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. Can you keep going? No, I think that's good. I think it's good. Oh God! Ah! Yes, frustration. No. Same? Yeah, same. Yeah. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. There it is. So if you look at this line five. 
<clears throat> someone asks you to describe life. Some of you, <laughs> most notably Alec, would be grand, full of possibility, lush, lovely, beautiful, a bit like a warm summer day lying in a meadow with sweet smelling flowers surrounding oneself. The calls of meadow birds, the lark looming in the distance with a sweet, sweet sound, its melody reaching my ears. Or I ask Andrew, like, hey Andrew, how's life? And he says, <laughs> he says, you want to know how life is? Weary, stale, flat, unprofitable. That's pretty much going to end our conversation, okay? Now, if I were like, you know, Sakyo or someone <laughs> who wanted to like, you know, counsel him, I'd be like, and you tell me why it's weird. <laughs> why stale? We're talking stale red or stale air? I mean, what's what's going on here? That's a really good impression. I, I would be like, see ya, okay, <laughs> and leave, because I don't want to deal with that. Now, Alec. I do the same thing. I'd be like, okay, I'll talk to you later. But if I say something to Vince, I'm like, hey, Vince, how's life? He's like, oh, that's good. I'm like, all right, cool, man. That's cool. That's cool. That's, that's all I want to hear. I'd that's say, all I want I'd to say it's smoking time, man. Yeah. Smoking. I don't want to hear you say it is weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. Because what kind of person are you if you say that? Weary, stale, flat, and Yeah, you're really depressed. But keep in mind, Hamlet's not putting on a show here. This is a soliloquy. He's alone on the stage, looking out into the distance, saying, my God, life is stale, life is weary, life is flat, it is unprofitable. I just want to die. Whoa. Okay. Um, that's one way to put it. But then he goes on. He doesn't just stop there. He goes on and says, seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on it. Ah, fie. Tis an unweeded garden. Okay, now we're getting into our close reading aspects here. Close reading, if you remember correctly, uses the elements we mentioned last week. What is our element of word choice? Diction. Specific words. So, when we say words like weary, what does weary mean? What does it make you feel? Sad. Very weak. tired. Tired. It, 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 okay, you, you, you wake up in the morning, you're like, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. But the, How is weary different? It usually implies that you've been working at something for a long time. And is it a positive or a negative kind of tired? Negative. Usually with tired or exhausted, it's like, oh, I'm worn out. Weary is you're weighted down by the reality of your existence. If you're weary, you're not just tired, you're mopey tired. If you find life to be stale, what kind of life are you finding? Not very good life. An unprofitable one. It's certainly not tasty. It's certainly not enjoyable. It's just bland and well. Just want to spit it out of your mouth. And we should pick up cooking. <laughs> yes, uh, quite possibly. Here's the thing though. In addition to diction, we also have syntax and imagery. All of these work together as aspects of figurative language. One aspect of figurative language is the metaphor. How do we know we just encountered a metaphor? <clears throat> What's our clue that that's a metaphor? This is definitely not an unweeded garden. What is he referring to as an unweeded garden? Life is reality. Look at the previous line. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Tis an unweeded garden. Tis meaning it is. What's the it? The world. He's saying the world is an unweeded garden. Now picture a garden that's unweeded. It's growing over, rank with weeds, dead leaves, all sorts of nastiness growing in there. It looks like it could have been nice at one point, but now it's just a chaotic mess. He says the world is an unweeded garden. It's a metaphor. Then he goes on to explain that grows to seed. What does that mean if something grows to seed? If your grass grows to seed, what does it do? It grows to the point where it releases seeds. 
Yeah, you know how if you let your grass grow for two weeks without mowing it, it gets really tall and then weird little seed things grow at the top? And then your mom or dad says, get out there and mow the yard. Because it looks pretty bad. It looks like it's completely untended, like it should be out in some field where no one's mowing it, not your house. The world has gone to seed. It's an unweeded garden. He goes on to say, things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. Blech. Now, we're about to get to the cause, the reason behind this. Look at what he says. That it should come to this. But two months dead, nay, not so much, not two, so excellent a king. Who has been dead for two months? The king. And not quite even two months. Two months, so excellent a king, that was, to this, Hyperion to a satyr, or satyr. Hmm, we have phones, we have access to technology. Let's look this up. Type as a satyr was a, a half man, a half goat. Explain the connection then, Noah. If I said, if I said you to you is like a Hyperion to a satyr. Well, they're from Greek mythology. And a, a titan super, super powerful, like fathers of the gods, I think. And Basically, my father was an awesome, amazing god. Yeah. And then he says, like cooler than a god. That was to this, to a lowly half man, half goat thingy. And when he says to this, who's he looking at? Oh, his uncle. It's much better. We went from my period to a sailor. Unbelievable. In two months' time. And then he says. So loving to my mother, this is talking about his father, that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth, must I remember? Why, she would hang on him, as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet, within a month, let me not think on it. And here we have the line that obviously feminists hate. Frailty, thy name is woman. What does Hamlet mean by this line? Frailty, thy name is woman. Okay. Now she's not present. But what's he saying about her? She's weak. She's weak. He's doing this by a reversal of syntax. What should the sentence read if read correctly, if written correctly? Mom, your name is frail. Yeah. Mom, or women, or whatever, you are frail. Instead, he reverses it, puts the object first. Frailty. Frailty. Weakness. Despair. Smallness. Your name is woman. Now, to be fair to Hamlin, he's obviously very depressed and upset right now. But what is he doing that is probably not logically sound? Putting the blame of his father's death on his mother? Not necessarily that. Applying one situation to all. Precisely. He's saying, my mother was weak and remarried quickly. Therefore, what? All women are weak. Well, Hamlet, you can't really make that kind of you know, statement. It's really not logically sound. But yet, he does anyway. He's obviously in a very depressed state. And he's mad. And how do we know that he's really kind of having a hard time processing this information based on the punctuation and syntax with these lines? What do we have a lot of here? Explanations. A lot of dashes. A dash is a pause or an aside. He says, and yet within a month, oh, let me not think on it. Frailty, that name is woman. Pause, pause, pause. Change direction. Think away, think away. And then he says, a little month, or ere those shoes were old, with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe. Anyone know who Niobe is? Another Greek goddess? <clears throat> Not a Greek goddess. Um, she's got kind of a cool story. Really sad. Um, she, at one point, um, she, she had a, a lot of sons and daughters. And she made a statement. Um, I forget the name of the goddess, but um, the mother of Apollo, 
the goddess mother of Lala, she said something like, I have more children and they're even more beautiful than such and such children. Well, you don't mess with the gods and goddesses. You'd think people would learn that, but they never do. So she sent Apollo down to kill each and every single child of Niobe's, right in front of Niobe, with arrows. So Apollo took them one by one and killed all the children. And Niobe was so overcome with grief that she didn't stop crying. She cried and cried and cried. And out of sympathy for her, the gods turned her into a stone fountain that was always producing water. Her grief caused that many tears. He's comparing his mother's grief over his father to Niobe. Only problem is, those tears stopped. And then she married the uncle. He goes on and says, why she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. What's he saying about his mother? She's worse than an animal. She's worse than an animal. Even an animal would have mourned longer. And then he's got another comparison here. Married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Okay, Hamlet is an academic. He's a brainiac. He is not a big buff dude. He's not Hercules. So he's got another comparison, outlandish comparison, about how good his father was and how bad his uncle is. But remember, we have to take this with a grain of salt, because he's obviously upset. Although we do find out in the course of a play that his father is not all that great. Okay, we are going to pause there, except I want you to look at the last line on the next page where it says, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Why does Hamlet stop speaking at this point? Someone else comes in. It breaks the soliloquy. No longer is he alone. And we go on with the rest of the play. Okay. You can just put this away for the time being. And I want you to take a look at this one. These are not from Hamlet. 